Well, normally, when I am sermon prepping, and I get down to the section of my sermon prep where I have to come up with an introduction, typically, I will I'll sit down and I'll really think about something that at least some group in the audience has some interest in. Whether it's a lot of interest, whether it's a little bit of interest, normally I'm thinking about you and how you will connect with whatever the introduction is. Normally, that's what I do. But today, I decided to open up with a story that I can guarantee you nobody in this room cares about at all. I, I am the only person in this room that cares about this. No one gives a rip about this story right here. But I, I want to tell you about a really terrible, really terrible section of our society, a really an epidemic, if you will, of just really, really bad people doing a lot of bad things. And uh, again, it's, I know it's just not unique to the thing that I'm going to talk about. I know a lot of people, a lot of different markets, a lot of different businesses struggle with this. Um, but right now, I don't think anyone in this room knows about how big of a deal it is that counterfeit golf clubs are, are taking off. So I, it's a big deal. It's a big deal. And uh, I was just reading this story this week about um, this raid that happened in this, um, I think it was three separate factories um, somewhere in China where the, the Chinese police came in and found over uh, like 120,000 fake golf clubs. And uh, fakes, counterfeits are not unique to golf. I mean, people do it with, you know, Louis Vuitton bags and shoes and a bunch of different stuff, a bunch of different expensive things. Sometimes people will make something cheap and try to make it look as close to the real thing as possible um, in lots of different areas. But specifically with golf clubs, it was a big, big deal. And on the screen here, we've got two different golf clubs. The top one is the authentic original, and then the bottom is a fake. And um, maybe you don't see a giant difference. When I look at these, it is so night and day which one is real and which one is fake. Can you guys tell, is the top real or is the top fake? Real or fake? Top, bottom. What do you guys think? Can't tell? Bottom is real? Bottom is fake. They look the same? They're all fake. They're not all fake. So the bottom is fake, majorly fake, majorly fake. Maybe you don't know what to look for, but look at, look at the paint job here on the right side. Do you see how clean the top is, how the, how the print is, how it, it, the, you know, the screen printed on the machine um, from the, you know, the manufacturer versus this fake job that looks like it was almost done with the Sharpie and the lines don't match up and there's just lots of shininess. There's no matte finishes. It's not well put together. And again, I look at this knowing a lot about golf clubs, and I can tell you from a mile away which one is real and which one is fake. Because I've been ripped off before on eBay when I buy a golf club and it shows up and it's like, wow, that does not look like the picture. That is really, really bad. I can tell someone made that with Sharpie, someone made that in their garage. And uh, it's a big deal for golf. It's a big deal for other, you know, shoes and bags and designer clothes and whatever um, is counterfeits. Um, and again, if you don't have a trained eye, maybe you can't tell the difference between these two pictures. But someone with a trained eye would be able to tell the difference between a, a real and a counterfeit. That was interesting. Tonight, our parable is a parable about real and counterfeit. And these two things to you might look very similar. They might look practically the same to, to an untrained eye. But tonight, we're going to dig into a parable where we see the difference between a real and a counterfeit and how those two things look completely different. And specifically, Jesus is going to teach this parable, maybe a parable that you're very familiar with, hopefully, um, is the parable of the two builders, the man who built his house upon the rock and then the man who built his house 
upon the sand and how these one is real, one is fake, one is a real Christian, one is a fake Christian, and it's very clear who the real and who the counterfeit is. So I'd love for you guys to open up to Matthew chapter 7 with me today. Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 through 27. Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 through 27. And when we study this parable tonight, I want you to have this picture in your mind of a real item versus a counterfeit item. And again, this parable makes the distinction much more black and white. It doesn't take a trained eye necessarily, if you will, to see the difference between these two. You get the man who built his house upon the rock and what happens to him. And the man that builds his house upon the sand, what happens to him, the counterfeit. It's going to be a helpful passage for us to study tonight as we look at how, how really important it is for us to make sure that we take obedience of God's word very, very seriously. Because the way that you obey God will be really, really helpful in helping you determine, helping you understand, helping you know whether you are a real, genuine Christian or a counterfeit one. And see, that is something that I think every person in this room needs to take a look at every so often in their life. M, is my claim of Christianity a real and genuine one, or is it a fake one? Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 through 27, I think will be one that will be helpful for you tonight. Matthew chapter 7, verse 24. Let's read it together. <clears throat> Jesus is preaching here, and he says, <clears throat> Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who builds his house upon the rock. As the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house, it, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who builds his house upon the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. Jesus here is wrapping up the Sermon on the Mount where he's been teaching to uh, just say a large gathering of people with a lot of, um, we, we should say, genuine Christians and counterfeit ones. And specifically, a group of people that were there in this sermon that Jesus was teaching uh, were the Pharisees. And you guys know about the Pharisees, right? They were these religious leaders who had a lot of pride, who had a lot of self-righteousness, who thought uh, the, the good works that they did earned favor with God. And so he's been going through all these different things. If you know... <clears throat> The Sermon on the Mount starts in chapter 5 of Matthew, chapter 6, and it finishes in chapter 7. He goes through different aspects of the law to try to show that, hey, you might think you are a real genuine Christian. I'm going to put a magnifying glass to that claim and say, are you really a genuine Christian or are you just a counterfeit? And so he's been talking, if you look up the page just to, or look up the screen, if you will, a couple verses above, we see a couple familiar um, sections there. If you look at verse 13, the, the narrow gate and the wide gate, uh, verse 15, you see that uh, you'll recognize a, a real versus a counterfeit Christian by their, by their fruit. Um, and then the famous passage in verse 21 through 23 about those who go before God and say, Lord, Lord, did, did I not prophesy in your name? Did I not do many mighty works in your name? And he will say, depart from me. I never knew you. And so he's been going back and forth between trying to identify genuine versus counterfeit. I think this parable that we are studying tonight is a great, helpful, counterfeit versus genuine black and white picture. If you are sitting in this room and you think that you're a Christian, I want you to really, really pay attention to what Jesus is teaching us here in this parable. And if you're not a Christian, I would also implore you to pay very close attention, very close attention to what Jesus does here. Because what he's doing is he's trying to show how important obedience to God's word really is. This first guy you see here, um, verse 24, verse 24, the wise man says he builds his house Upon It says, everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who builds his house upon the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon the house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. So we see this first guy choose to hear Jesus and what he was teaching and actually do something about it and obey him. Choosing swift obedience. And then we see when this flood comes, the winds come and everything, his house does not fall. And basically what he's trying to say there is that when the 
storm, when the final judgment storm of, uh, of Jesus coming back and you standing before your maker one day, when, when he puts all of your deeds, if you will, up on the TV screen and says, this is the good you've done, this is the bad you've done, you will be able to stand in that day, not because of your good works, but because of what Jesus did for you on the cross. And so, write it down this way for point number one. I think this will be hopefully helpful for you. Point number one, choose swift obedience, reap eternal life. If you choose swift obedience, then you will reap eternal life. First, let's correct what we don't mean here. Because that statement right there, that point that you just wrote down, that you're writing down right now, that can be very, very confusing if you know, if you understand what I'm not saying. What I'm not saying, what this parable is not saying is, hey, if you are a good person, if you do a lot of good works, then when you come before God one day, he will say, oh, you're a real Christian because you do a lot of good things. That's not what he's saying here. And I know we've talked about this before, but I think this will be helpful for us to look at again. You see on the next slide here, we see a couple different fake salvation gospel equations. The first one, you can write it down if you want. That would be helpful if you do. Is the gospel plus the response equals salvation? What do we mean by that? So, someone that hears the gospel, that Jesus died on the cross for their sins, and they respond by saying, okay, I want to be a Christian, so I'm going to repent of my sin and place my faith in Christ. Good, that's a good thing. But then nowhere on this first equation do you see any obedience take place. This is someone that says, hey, I go to revival and I want to be a Christian. I want to sign up to be a Christian. I think that will be a good thing for me. I don't have to go to hell now. But then they go back to school and they live the life that they used to live. We looked a couple weeks ago about the four soils. You guys remember soil two and soil three? The, the seed that fell on the soil with the, the rocky ground and then the thorny ground. They receive the word with joy. They respond. They're excited. I want to be a Christian. But then by their life, they prove to be a counterfeit Christian a fake Christian, because they don't actually show any good works, bear any fruit in their life. So the problem with the first one is that there's, there's no obedience, there's no good works. I can be a Christian, I could be on Team Jesus, but I can live like the rest of the world, and I can live for my sin continually. The second one on here that's also wrong, fake salvation, it's the gospel plus the response, plus if I do a lot of good things, then I will become a Christian. And I know that is some people in this room, they think, they still think, regardless of how many times we talk about it in small groups or from up here, that your good works will, in some form or fashion, make you attractive to God, where God will say, oh, I want this person. I, I'm going to... I'm going to save them because they do a lot of good things for me. That's also wrong. Because can anyone gain anything, gain any favor? Can any one of you pay for your own sins right now? Do enough good works to pay back some time you complained or sometime you talked back to your parents? Can you pay back your own sin? I think when we ask that question, all of us would say, no, no, I, I can't do that. That's impossible. You can't, you can't earn any um, right standing before God by just doing stuff. And so what Jesus is trying to describe here in this parable is what the genuine gospel equation is, the right salvation equation is. Those two are, are, are not right. But this one I think you can write down. I think, I think I know based on what God's word tells us that this is right. That the gospel, you understand what Jesus did for you. You respond by re repenting of your sin and placing your faith in Jesus Christ. You become a Christian. And then after you become a Christian, you will now prove that by your good works. They're, those good works are not a cause for God to like you and say, oh, I want to save that person. The good works, the fruit comes after. It's not a cause, but it's a result. It's what happens after you become a Christian. So when you're sitting in small groups and you're like, oh, you know, I don't know if I'm a Christian, so I'm just going to try harder and do better this week. That doesn't cut it. A real Christian says, 
I respond with repentance and faith. I become a Christian. And then after that, now I live a life of bearing fruit, of good works. So basically what Jesus is trying to explain here is that a real Christian has real genuine faith and then they live it out with their life. You can also write down James chapter 2, verse 14 and verse 26. James chapter 2, verse 14 and 26. James says, What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? For as the body is apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. If you claim to be a Christian, then your life will look like it. You will bear fruit. You will show good works in your life. And what this parable serves to show us here is that a real Christian, when they're confronted by God's word, they will respond the right way. Not saying that you can earn favor with God, not saying that your good works get you into heaven, but what we are saying is that if you're a Christian, you will then live in obedience to God. So let's look back at verse 24 of our text. Verse 24, it says, Everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like this wise man who builds his house upon the rock. He builds his house upon this firm foundation that will not move, that's unshakable. Because he hears what Jesus is saying, he hears what God's word is, and then he does something about it. He, there's this firm foundation aspect. Um, in uh, the Gospel of Luke, he also gives this parable. Luke chapter 7, uh, he gives this parable. Um, and the way that he does it is, the way that he does it in Luke is a little bit differently. He talks about the firmness of foundation rather than the rock and the sand. He talks about the deep digging of a foundation, Luke chapter uh, 6, rather. Luke chapter 6, uh, verse 47 through 49. The necessity of a strong, firm foundation. You know you're getting old when... When you watch TV, you start watching HGTV, which has happened to me, and it's really sad. I was, you know, ESPN, well, Golf Channel all the time, and then now it's like HGTV is on our TV now, and um, I don't actually hate it as much as I thought I would, but Karina, I've been watching some HGTV shows, these people that go buy these houses and then try to make them really nice and try to flip them to go make more money, and they make it really nice. And sometimes they, one of the shows, they bought this house that was on a cliff, kind of like this picture here, like a, one of those houses that have like a really nice view of the ocean. This is down in San Clemente, um, where these, these houses are, are overlooking the ocean that are on a cliff that have this great view. Um, but they bought one of these houses that was on this cliff. And, and once they bought it, uh, the contractors or whatever came in and said, hey, your house is actually tilting down the hill. And you didn't know that when you bought it. And so what they had to do is they had to go and pay like, I don't know what it was, $100,000 to go. It was actually insane how they did this. They took these like hydraulics. They went down under the house to pick up the house so that they could put like a firm foundation under it, which was crazy. I that you can pick up a house. That's, that's a lot of strength right there. But I guess power of hydraulics and science there. But anyway, they, what they did is they had to pay all this money to fix the foundation because it was slipping down the hill. Because when you buy one of these houses, you don't want your house to look like this. You don't want the, the gravel underneath the landslide to happen, a lot of water or whatever, wind or something like that, for the house to now start tilting, tilting, tilting until it actually falls down the hill. You don't want this to happen when you, get, when you buy a house on a cliff like that. So you got to go in, you got to dig a, a firm foundation like this, concrete, rod the wrought iron, all those, all those different things to make sure, dig down deep so, so that you have a cement, a firm foundation under it so that you can build and you know that this house will not move in any way. And so what Jesus is trying to do is he's trying to show that the one who obeys God is like this firm foundation with a non-landslide foundation that is firm and flat and stable and secure and steadfast. So that when the rain comes, and the wind comes, and the weather comes, that the house is not going to slip down the hill. Jesus is trying to say here, basically, that if you obey me, when that happens, when you meet your maker one day, you can have confidence. I want you to think right now about what it will be like to stand before God on Judgment Day. That is, you can't think of a scarier thought than that, in terms of, just humanly speaking. That is scary, to stand before your maker and answer for every word, every thought, every deed you've ever done. That scares me to my core as well. 
But if you are a Christian, if you are a genuine Christian that hears and obeys, you're like this firm foundation that cannot be shaken, that cannot be moved. Because ultimately, your hope is not in something that you have in it of yourself. Right? What does a real Christian do? We use the word faith all the time. Why? One, because the Bible uses it. We use the word faith because as a Christian, you are putting your faith in someone else, someone that is secure. Jesus Christ. He is secure. You are not. The, man, the foolish man who builds his house upon the sand, he builds his house upon what he could do himself. But if you're a Christian, you put your faith in Jesus so that when God looks at you on Judgment Day, yeah, he sees you in terms of who you are and your name and what you've done, but ultimately he counts you when he looks at you as if you were Jesus. Perfect, spotless, blameless, sinless, never broken any commandment that he's talking about here in the Sermon on the Mount. I love the way that Jesus ends this sermon because he's basically said a bunch of stuff about how to obey God. And then at the very end, he says, this is why it's so important. Because on judgment day, you will fall if you are trusting in yourself. But if you're trusting this foundation, then you have something to have hope in. There's a blessing for the one who truly proves their faith by their obedience. And then there's consequence for the one that doesn't. See, this wise man here, he... he Really, the picture of a, a real Christian, the genuine Christian. Think back to the, the golf clubs there, the, the real one that we base everything off, the counterfeit off of. The genuine Christian that has put their faith in the foundation, if you will, of Christ and his perfection and holiness and blamelessness on your part. But then as a genuine Christian, like we said earlier, your job, your calling is now to obey God until the day that you die, which is really hard. That's a, that's, a, that's a very difficult thing. But you have confidence because you're depending on someone, not yourself. So if you're a Christian, you need to really look at this parable, make sure that you are living a life of constant, habitual, growing obedience. And I'm not saying perfection. We talk all the time about fruit. I want you to hear me loud and clear. I'm not talking about perfection. No one here in this room is ever going to be perfect on this side of heaven. You can try really hard, but you're never going to be absolutely 100% perfect, never sin again until you get to heaven. Even Paul says that. Philippians chapter 3, verse 12, he says, I, Paul, the apostle Paul, who's a lot godlier than any of us in this room, he says, not that I've already obtained it, this, or I'm already perfect, but I press on and make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. If you're a real Christian, you're not going to be perfect on this side of heaven, but you continue to strive and push to obey. And I think tonight is a great night for you to look at your life right now. If you are a Christian, look at your life and say, how swift, how quick, how sincere is your obedience to God? And I mean in every aspect of your life, your thought life, your words, your actions, what you do on your phone, every little thing about you. And again, that is a scary, you know, scary thing to do, obviously. But are, are you actively hearing, obeying, and growing? I'm not saying, are you perfect? But I'm saying, are you growing? Are you responding? When you do sin, you're responding in repentance, saying, I want to get away from that. I'm going to do everything that I can to stay away, as far away from sin as I possibly can. That you're going to God's word and saying, how can I obey it? How can I obey it? I want to obey it. I fell short yesterday. I want to obey it today. What do I do? How do I do it? God, help me do it. Striving, 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 striving to obey God. James chapter 1, verse 25 says, the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, that's a hard thing to do, persevere, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. It will take effort for you as a Christian to obey God until the day that you die. That's a hard thing. But this verse right here is telling you that what you have in your laps, the perfect law, the law of liberty, you have the guidebook from God to continually grow 
in your obedience to him. Do you respond in obedience when you read your Bible in the morning? You respond in obedience when you come to CSM or you come on Sunday morning, you hear Pastor Elliot teach about what to do, how to obey God. Do you respond in obedience? Or is it just, uh, yeah, I mean, whatever. It doesn't really matter. I'll try, but I mean, whatever. It's fine. Are you apathetic? Or are you swift and active and disciplined? Putting in effort. I mean, this right here, be, perseveres, be no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts. I don't know about any of you. I'm a forgetful person. I forget a lot of things. It's a hard thing to obey God, but that picture of persevering, saying, I'm not going to forget what I learned. A lot of you right now are taking notes. That's a good thing. Why do you take notes? Just because you have to? Just because that's what everyone else does? Are you taking notes because I want to know God's word and I want to put it into practice? Ultimately, that should be your reason of taking notes. One reason of why I take notes is because I know if I listen to something, I'm probably going to forget a lot. If I went on Sunday morning to hear Pastor Elliot teach and I didn't take any notes, I would forget so much of it. So I take notes. I'm actively engaging my mind. I'm, I'm, I'm writing down what he's saying. I'm writing down verses. I'm trying to uh, apply different things that he's saying so that I can go back and I can reference and I can say, what did I learn on Sunday? Oh, that's right. I learned that. I need to be doing this and practicing this in my life. Every one of us needs to be doing that. Look at verse 25. Verse 25, it says, when all of this happens, the, the rain and the floods and the winds come, the house does not fall because it's founded upon the rock. Well, ultimately what it, this verse is telling you is that if you're a Christian, you live your life in obedience because you are a Christian, not to earn favor with God, that on the day of judgment, you can be confidently sure that you will be okay. Hebrews 9.27 says, all of us are going to die. All of us are going to stand before God. Just as it is appointed for man once to die, and after that comes judgment. Another one, Ecclesiastes 12, 14. It says, For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. That is scary. There is a heavy storm coming, if you will. The wind is going to come. The waves are going to come. The floods are going to come. But with the firm foundation of Jesus Christ dying for your sins, You have nothing to fear. God is not going to send any Christian to hell. That sounds like a really basic, dumb statement right there, but there's no Christians in hell. God will never send a Christian to hell. Because a, a genuine Christian is someone that hears, obeys, and will survive this storm, not on their own power, but on the power of what Jesus did for them on their behalf. But we see the other guy here in this text, verse 26, who lives his life very differently. Who lives his life like some people here in this room. Verse 26 says, Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who lives his house upon the sand. When the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house, it fell and great was the fall of it. See, the foolish man, he hears the same thing. He hears Jesus. I mean, I'd be awesome if, if instead of hearing me every Wednesday, you could, Jesus Christ came and, and started teaching you guys. That would that'd be, be awesome. That'd be a major upgrade for you. And I would, I would sit front row right here with you. But when we open up God's word, whose word is it? God's word, Jesus's word. So every time you come face to face with God's word, you cannot be like this foolish man who hears and does not do because this house falls away. Just sitting here and believing God's word, but then doing nothing about it, that's not going to get you anywhere. Right now, let's wait for point number two. If you settle, if you settle for apathetic disobedience, reap eternal destruction. Settle for apathetic disobedience, you will reap eternal destruction. What does that word apathetic mean? Apathetic just means 
indifferent, lazy, no interest, no enthusiasm. And I think that's how a lot of people in this room disobey God. Sometimes, yeah, it's full-blown rebellion. I know what the Bible says. I know what God says. I'm going to do the exact opposite because I don't want to do that. But most of the time, it's because you forget. It's because you're lazy, you're indifferent, you're forgetful, you're apathetic, not blatantly choosing evil because, you know, you just, you want to be an evil person. But you choose it maybe sometimes because you're, you're apathetic to what God's word says. This foolish man, his, his house is, has no foundation. It builds upon the sand. So think about the man that builds his house upon the sand is the guy who trusts in himself, in his own stuff, his own good works, and putting his trust in something other than Jesus. That's what the foolish man does. He just builds wherever, wherever he can find some, some nice sand. He starts going, doing whatever he wants to do, making himself his own God. I think there are people in this room that have made themselves their own God. You care about what you think more than you care about what God thinks. And push comes to shove, I'm going to do whatever I want to do rather than what God wants me to do. If that's you, you're the foolish man here. You're building your house upon the sand. And verse 27 says, rain's going to come, floods are going to come, the winds are going to come. It's going to beat against your house, if you will. And it's going to fall. And it says, great was the fall of it. If you're your own God living for yourself, here at 1 John 2, 16, shows us here. It says, for all that is in the world, desires of the flesh, desires of the eyes, pride of life, is not from the Father, but is from the world. There are people in this room living for these three things here. The desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life. Doing whatever you want. Whatever you see, I want that. I'm going to take that. I don't care what the right thing to do is, I'm just going to do it. Desires of my flesh, doing whatever feels good, the pleasure that I can get. Desires of the, of the eyes, whatever I think is the shiny object out there that I don't have, I'm, I need it, I, I have to have it, I covet it, I need it, I'm going to take it. The pride of life, building yourself up, trying to make a name for yourself because you you love yourself so much. It's ultimately the... Uh, You have replaced God in your life with yourself. You are your own God in this case. And this happens when you forget. This happens when you forget to obey God. James 1, 22 through 24 says, But be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror, and he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. Maybe this is you on a maybe a major scale or a minor scale. I just, I see no growth in my life. I show up to CSM, I show up to church, and just nothing's going on in my heart. Nothing's going on in my life. I'm not seeing any growth. You go away, you look at God's word, and then you forget. It's a big deal. Puts their faith in something that is unstable. I'm sure this has happened to you many times in your life when you need to hang something that's high up and there's some chairs around. I don't know if you, any of you have had to stand on these chairs before. Or you see, you, you, you're at a room and you have one of these like office desk chairs that's, that swivel, right? Do you try to stand on those before? How does that go? Not super great, right? Honestly, when that's the only chair you can stand up on, you have to like call someone else to come and hold it for you so that it doesn't swivel while you stand on it. But if I'm trying to hang something up up here, I'm, and I see a, an office chair, and I see a wooden chair, if you will, that's got four legs, it's not going to move, I'm going to choose that wooden chair 10 times out of 10. Why? Because I know when I put my weight on it, there's stability there. I know that when I move, it's not going to twist out from under me or fall over because it's got wheels slip out from under me. The man that builds his house upon the sand is like, putting your, you know, trying to go hang Christmas lights with an office chair. It's not going to work out too well. It's unstable. If you look at your life right now, you think, man, I, I do some good things, though. Like, I'm not as bad as that next guy. I'm not as bad as that guy that 
is at my school. He's way worse than me. I'm not as bad as my older brother. Like, he's, he's a pretty bad dude. I'm okay. There's other people that are a lot worse than me. I do some good things. But you also do some bad things. And a lot of them. A lot of them. Do you think that if your life is filled with a lot of bad and just a little bit of good, that your good somehow outweighs your bad? Do you think God is going to be there on Judgment Day and say, hey, how much good did you do? Throw it in this pile. Throw how much bad you do in this other, on this other side, and we're just going to weigh the scales and figure out if this person's a Christian or not. That's not what's going to happen. But some of you might think that will happen just because in your own mind you're trying to like rationalize what it will be like. Thinking that what you do as a good church kid will get you any favor with God. If you put your faith in yourself, do you, do you see the instability of the office chair or the sand? You have nothing to stand on. It's going to slip out from under you. Oh, I did some good things too. Okay, but your life is defined by sin, the rest of it. I know that this one you know, this passage, but Isaiah 64, six, Isaiah 64 verse 6 says, that your good works are nothing. It says, we have all become like one who's unclean. All of our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. I'll fade like a leaf. Our iniquities like the wind take us away. You are so unattractive to God. Your sin is so unattractive to God. Because of your sin, you are unattractive to God. Your good works are unattractive to God. The only thing that's attractive to God is Jesus' perfection. So if you don't have that, you're like the foolish man with his house upon the sand. When the rains come and the floods come and the winds come, you will fall. The Bible describes the fall of this foolish man as a very bad one. Second Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 8 and 9 says, In flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God, those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, they will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord, from the glory of his might. The consequences for your sin are so big. So big. However, there is hope in the gospel that if you put your faith in Jesus Christ, in the firm foundation that is available for you, you will have all of your sins paid for. And we've talked about this word before. When Jesus died, he said, it is finished. To tell us die, it's, it literally just means that the debt has been paid. Everything has been taken care of. When Jesus died on the cross for your sins, he paid it all back. The foolish man's trying to pay his own sin back by trusting in himself. But the wise man, he knows he can't please God. He puts his faith in the firm foundation that is Jesus. I think a good question for you to answer tonight is, where are you building your house? Are you building it upon the sand? Are you building it upon the rock? Because that que- the way that you answer that question really, really matters. Eternal, comp- eternal consequences for the way that you answer that question. So let's bow our heads in prayer right now. God, Thank you for um, teaching us in such illustrative ways like parables. We thank you for this parable that shows us the difference between obedience and disobedience and how important it is for us as Christians to live as those who are obedient to you and to your word. Pray for every student in this room that is a genuine believer. God, may they live this week, next week, next month more obedient to you than they were last month. God, help me live a life that is more obedient to you than it was last month, last year. God, we ask that you would help us, strengthen us, establish us to grow in our obedience to you. God, we do pray for those in this room that have built their house upon the sand. God, may you convict them. God, may you show them the firm foundation that Jesus Christ has laid on their behalf so that they could have their sins paid for under no effort of their own, but under the effort that Jesus put in himself for them on their behalf. God, we thank you for that truth. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.